Well, I'm glad to see you all here today, and uh, we are all had a wonderful, beautiful weekend, and now it's going to rain, but uh, we're, we're going to worship anyway. Let's pray together. Oh, God, open us up. Open our eyes that we might see and our ears that we might hear. Open our hearts, God, that we might feel. And then, oh, Lord, open our hands that we might serve. Amen. So I, uh, like you, I suspect have been watching the, um, the, the videos of, of September 11th, what that was like. Brought back all those memories, man, for, for those of us who were alive at that time and can remember where we are, were at that moment and lots of memories just um, anchoring themselves inside us. And I, I certainly remember uh, just the anguish and the pain um, I remember how we all came to church. Everybody, it was like, uh, I've often thought about, you know, when you see a, a child in the grocery store and you bend down to talk to her or him and they run back to their mother skirt and kind of cling to the skirts. It was like we ran back to the, our mother church's skirt and uh, gathered there. But there was something else that happened that, uh, it was it was like all of all of the things that we thought mattered so much stopped mattering so much, and the things that we had sort of let slide came to the surface. Things like uh, loving our children and loving our neighbor and loving our country. Um, things like our faith came. We came running back to church. All, all of a sudden, the other things that seem so important just sort of fell to the bottom. There's something that, that's called the Brazil nuts effect. And then if you took a, a can of mixed nuts like this and you, and you shook it, 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 all, uh, and then you opened it, the ones on top would be the Brazil nuts because they're the biggest. And the little nuts... The, the uh, peanuts and the others all fall down to the bottom. And that's a, the, the, the essence is that there are some events in our lives that just do that to us. They just bring the important stuff to the surface. So the, the big stuff, the stuff that really matters, comes to the surface and the other stuff takes lesser. There are other kinds of Brazil nuts events other than September 11th. Right? You have an automobile accident that's serious. And you think, man, I could have died. And that shakes you up. Or a, a natural disaster. Or, or maybe a diagnosis. Right? Like um, Eugene Kelly was the uh, CEO of KPMG, a big accounting firm, when he was diagnosed with a terminal uh, tumor in his brain. He was given three months to live. Let me read to you uh, what he says. His book is called Chasing Daylight. It came out uh, over 10 years ago. He, uh, he so what did he do? What did he do with three months left to live? He wrote a book. I was blessed. I was told I only had three months to live. You put those two sentences back to back, I must be joking or crazy, but I'm quite sane and quite serious. The verdict I received in May of 2005 turned out to be a gift, honestly, because I was forced to think seriously about my own death, which meant I was forced to think more deeply about my life than I had ever done. I, um, I suppose you're familiar with the, the uh, verse that forms the basis for this sermon series, choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. But the context of it is this. Joshua has led the children of Israel into the promised land. He has led them in conquering the promised land. It has been conquered now, although there's still bubblings and uprisings all around it. And now he realizes that he's going to die. And he wonders if he's passed on to his, uh, to his people, to the nation, to the people of Israel, if he's passed on to them the values that he wanted to pass on to them. 
It's a, it's a pretty typical thing that you would think of if you're a parent who realizes that your life is going to end. Here's what he writes or says. I now am about to go the way of all the earth. And you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one thing has failed. All of the, all of the good things that the Lord has promised concerning you, all have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. And then he goes on to say, so you can decide who you're going to serve, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. The Brazil nuts effect says, this is what matters. So here's the deal. We want to live, every one of us wants to live our lives. We only have so many days, so many resources, so much energy. We want to live our lives consistent with the values that we believe in. We want to live our lives, I think those of you here, want to live your lives consistent with the values that Jesus taught us. Christian values. I believe that, that those of us who are parents want our children, our household, to live their lives based on the values that Jesus taught us. So the point of this whole sermon series is how do we do that? How do we decide to do that? And I want to give you three words today that can help you. So um, the first word is intentionality. Intentionality. Choose this day whom you will serve. Choose it. Make a choice. Be intentional. I uh, got a new car just before, um, before Christmas. It is a Honda Ridgeline truck. It is wonderful. It's one of the mid-sized trucks. It is, I like it because it is city in the front and country in the back. It's, it's like a mullet haircut, you know? It's city in the front, and it just looks all city. In fact, it looks exactly like the car I had before that. that parents, you are the primary teachers. You are the primary one that help form the spirituality of a child. We have to choose to be intentional. We have to decide what matters to us. As for me, I have to decide what matters for me, and then I want to do what I can to share that with the family around me. I listen, uh, one of my favorite um, music that I listen to, my wife harasses me. She said, do you just listen to the same thing over and over and over again? Yeah, I kind of do. Uh, is uh, the soundtrack from Hamilton. 
I just uh, love the, that musical. And, you know, early in the beginning, uh, Aaron Burr and Hamilton meet, and Aaron Burr is like, just, just go along to get along, right? Just decide, just go along. The, the revolution is beginning, and uh, here, here's, here's how the, um, here's, here are the lyrics. Burr, the revolution's imminent. What do you stall for? If you stand for nothing, Burr, what will you fall for? Oh, man, I think we could say that to ourselves and our children. Then, then later near the end of it, it uh, in, in a disagreement that leads to Hamilton's death in a duel, Aaron, uh, they, uh, Hamilton speaks about why he's endorsing Jefferson rather than Burr for president. And he says, and I've never agreed with Jefferson once. We fought on like 75 different fronts. But when all is said and all is done, Jefferson has beliefs. Burr has none. I wonder if what people would say about you. Have you been intentional? Have you chosen what you believe? That's the first, the first word, intentionality. The second word is differentiation. This is a little, a, a little more complicated, but I think, I think this can make it a little easier. When I was a kid, I lived next door to Danny Seibert. Danny was a couple of years older than I was and led me into trouble sometimes. Uh, like one time, uh, we got caught throwing dirt clods at cars. Dirt clods are very cool. You know, they kind of explode when they hit something. And so we were throwing dirt clods at cars and, you know, we got caught and um, my parents were naturally very angry, and they said, um, why were you throwing dirt clods at cars? And I said, well, Danny Seibert was throwing dirt clods at cars. And my parents said the same thing that has been said to you, and you have said to your children, if Danny Seibert jumped off of a cliff, would you jump off of a cliff? And probably I would. Uh, if, he, you know, if he ended up okay, then I probably would go for it. I'll jump off the cliff too. Right? Danny, if Danny Seibert, so here's, here's the concept of differentiation. The Seiberts are the Seiberts, the Paces are the Paces. Danny Seibert is Danny Seibert. Tom, you are Tom. You are your person. You have to decide. That's the concept of, of differentiation. Um, let me read to you what uh, Karen Koenig says. This is how she defines it. She's a, a psychologist. Self-differentiation involves being able to possess and identify your own thoughts and feelings and distinguish them from others. It's a process of not losing connection to the self while holding a deep connection to others, including those you love whose views may differ from yours. So, look, this is so important for us, and I think it's at the root of so many of the problems that our, our nation faces, our society faces. The ability to say, look, this is what we believe, and this is what you believe, and I'm not judging you. I'm not judging you for what you believe. I hold fast to what I believe, and it's okay for you to believe something different. I'm going to let you do that. Uh, let me give you a, a little example. So family differentiation is the notion that our family believes this and your family may believe something else. Uh, Mike, we have all of the kids, the grandkids together and we are having, uh, we have dinner and after dinner, uh, one of my daughter's children pick up their plates. They're, what, he's five, he's walking back to the counter like this and we're like, please don't drop it, you know, because you think he might. And he says, you, I hear him say to his cousin, our, in our family, when dinner's over, we carry our plates to the counter. And his cousin says, in our family, we don't do that. And they just went on about their business. It wasn't like you should do it. It was just like, this is what our family does. This is what your family does. Here's the thing, we, we have to, to understand that, e that even in this room, while we all hold fast to Christian values, 
the, the clarity, the sense of, of this, is, this is what we believe. Let me give you another example. I get a call from a Sunday school teacher. No, no, I get a call from a parent upset about a Sunday school teacher, uh, an elementary age Sunday school teacher. This is what that Sunday school teacher taught my daughter. And uh, I, I have to confess, I wasn't pleased with what she, she had, you know, and she'd got it third hand, so who knows. But my response was, so what did you say? And the lady said, well, I told her, we don't believe that in our family. And I said, was that a good discussion? And she said, we had a great discussion. And I said, wow, well, that sounds like that went really well then. And, you know, I said, yeah, we would talk about the, what the Sunday school teacher taught. But remember, that Sunday school teacher's influence on your child is minuscule. And in fact, it may be a positive thing if you can help differentiate your, this is what we believe. And it's different than others. And we don't have to dislike other people because they, they, they think differently than we do. We, as for me and my household, you choose for yourself whom you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Do not be conformed to the standards of this world, but be, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That's, that's, the, that's the notion of differentiation. Now, as a child grows older, we then have issues of self-differentiation. This realization that, that I don't have to agree with everything in my family. That's, uh, that makes Thanksgiving a lot better. I got a little feedback coming. You hear it? Thank you. Uh, that makes Thanksgiving a lot better if you realize that, you know, my father or my in-laws or whomever may disagree with me. But I'm really clear about what I believe. I'm comfortable in my own skin. So I don't feel the need to uh, yell and shout. Right? I can be quietly right. Self-differentiation. All right. If Danny jumped off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge? Oh, a cliff. It's a cliff. Here's the third thing. The third word is clarity. Do you have clarity about what you believe? Um, it, it, in some establishments, they have posted on the walls house rules. I'll have to confess that when I was in college, there was, I heard, I never went there, of course, there was a bar called Pizza King. And Pizza King was a biker bar. And on the wall were posted the rules, and one of the rules was no fighting with pool cues or pool balls. <laughs> and I, the implication is that what you can fight with something else, but you just don't break the pool cues or hurt somebody with the pool balls. I, it was quite a place, right? When we were in uh, Guatemala uh, with Zoe Ministries, um, they had a, a they had church in this room. This dank, damp room in a community center there. And on the walls were posted house rules. And uh, here, here were some of the rules. Uh, I, these are, I'll translate. Hours of service, 3 p.m. and 5 p.m. Uh, be on time or early. Remember, it's a privilege to be here. That literally is fulfill your privilege. I had to ask people, what is that? How, how does that really translate? Remember, it's a privilege to be here. No eating candy in church, no chewing gum, turn off your phone, no talking in the service, no sleeping in the church. That's an important one. And do not get, and Paul was preaching once and a guy fell out of the window while he was preaching, fell asleep and fell out the window. So I, if you fall asleep, I, at least I'm in good company. Do not, do not get up and leave the service. Man, they ran a tight ship at that, at that church. I found a, uh, a restaurant, I, I went to a restaurant, I had to take a picture of the sign out front. No flip-flops, no shorts, no torn jeans, no sneakers, welcome! <laughs> uh, sometimes I think that's how we do church, right? You know, welcome but, welcome but, yeah, it's tough. Look, you see, when you write something down, when you, when you create a sense of clear house rules, what, what happens, that gives you clarity. It, 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 even if it's not posted, the act of writing it down clarifies it for you. 
Um, here, so Paul, often when he's writing a church, will give them a set of house rules. The German word is house to fall. Um, here's a set, like here's Romans 12. Love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. There it is. That's a list of rules. That's, what, that's how we live together right there. Those are our values. Here is from 1 Thessalonians 5. We urge you, beloved, admonish the idlers, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all of them. See that none of you repay evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of the prophets, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Friends, um, <clears throat> when I do memorial services, one of the things I always ask the family as we're planning it is, so tell me what this person stood for. And there's always sort of a, a, a silence. And it, it makes me a little sad. Often they can tell you what politics they stood for. They know that. They got told that a lot. But what else did they stand for? What did they stand for in terms of how to treat other people? What, what, what did they stand for in terms of how to use their time and their money? What, what did they stand for about compassion, about service? Just the act of writing it down. You know, I, I've shared with you before that I, I try and uh, keep in front of me my values, right? Compassion, joy, positivity, action, and growth. Those five, I put them down, they're on my uh, uh, opening page. I see them as often as I can to just remind myself, this is, who, this is how I want to live my life. This is where I want to invest my time and energy and align myself with that. On your bulletin are, uh, is a little exercise you can do if you want. There's lots of ways to do this, but I really want to encourage you to make your own list or, or your own mission statement or identify your own uh, scripture verse that you think is, is the verse that says, this is what I stand for, this is what I believe in. And let that guide you. There's some questions there that will help you maybe, but you can find others as well. It's just a way to get you thinking, to get clarity about what you believe. You know, we hear a lot of talk about family values. And what, what's interesting is I, I, I embrace it completely. I'm just not sure I mean it by it the same thing that, that media means when they say it. What I mean by it is that we as families need to get clear about our values. And every, every family has to choose this day whom they will serve. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious God, um, we confess that there's so many voices that are trying to guide us, pull us all different directions, set our agendas for us. Um, and it's hard. It's hard not to be pulled. But every once in a while, God, there are these events, these um, challenges that, that bring the important things, those Brazil nuts, to the top. And we want to spend the majority of our lives on those important things and to live by them. So guide us, God. Help us to be in, intentional and, and to differentiate ourselves and, and to be clear about what we stand for. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.